produced by Victoire. Victoire gives a special thanks to the EWF, Empire Wrestling Federation, and Mr. Jesse Hernandez, as well as SoCal Wrestling TV. Find the app on Roku. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Stylin' the Podcast. I am your host, Emir, along with my co-host, Rico Casatino, the WWE and AEW superstar. Yep, write that down now. Yeah, uh, I was fortunate. Well, um, as you know, last week I had to leave the show early. Mm -hmm. I got a call. I couldn't say nothing. And I swore you to secrecy. Yes, when I did tell you, when I did tell you, but yeah, uh, executives from AEW called and they said their tag team MXM collective needed my guidance mm -hmm. because they were going against the acclaimed and guess who was acclaimed's manager. Oh, I think I know, but, but tell the audience who it was. Saggy ass Billy Gunn, ah. my old client, the yeah. largest disappointment of my entire illustrious career yeah it's a blemish yeah and i when i heard that i was on the plane they sent a private plane i got on that flew to seattle and started working with mason and mansoor yeah getting them all ready and then we're having a match and then things got crazy it's getting tougher and everybody spilled out you know and my guy was reaching my sewer's reaching in the ring. I just went in the ring. I didn't do anything, but I was trying to pull him up to get his momentum, possibly to get a good count out victory win, a vis a V. Yeah, yeah. So I was yeah. pulling him in, pulling him in, and then I slipped. And unbeknownst to me, that Billy Gunn mm -hmm. snuck up behind me, yeah. snuck up. And then I turned around. I, he was in the ring with me. We're not supposed to wrestle. Mm -hmm. And he's telling me all this stuff. And I went, wait a minute. Uh, you disrespectful. So I went to spin kick him. He must have been on his Geritol because he was quick. Yeah. He caught my foot, kicked me in the gut, and he gave me a famouser. Unbelievable. He had the audacity to famouser me. What saggy a, ass. What a gun. What an insult, Rico. Oh. Rico. Unbelievable. But as you as the viewers can see at the bottom of the screen. We are joined by our special guest this week, Rico. He is none other than the WWE Hall of Famer, Mr. Mister Everything Under the Sun. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Rob Van Dam. Greetings, fellow uh, podcast. Nice to see Hello, you, man. RVD. Good to see you, Rico. It's been a minute. It's uh, been, always, yeah, a minute and 30 seconds. Always, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> always good to see you. Yeah. Always good. You still in Vegas? Yes, sir. You're still in Vegas? The All first right. cold day of the year to right oh. now. Mm -hmm. yep. We got a little where bit of cold. At, where are you at, Rico? Oh, you, still you should ask. Oh. oh, I'm living in Vegas, but right now I'm in the Phoenix area. Rico, yeah, uh, why, why are you in Phoenix, by the way? Oh, well, there's uh, something that's up and coming, a uh, competitive event. It's called Mounted Cowboy Shooting. And it's... You could join the uh, Cowboy Mountain Suiting Association or America's Suiting Association. But I'm here with the, you know, under the CMSA uh, and Cowboys. It's 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 a big event. There's six levels to this and the requirements are dress code for this. You don't just get on a horse and whatever. Oh, yeah. You have to look Western. Yeah. 1800, 1900, your shirt, your pants have to be five buckle of uh, five pocket pants it's got to be boots mm -hmm. you know cowboy hat everything and there's six levels to this they use single action revolvers like a Colt 45 peacemaker mm -hmm. uh ruger makes them they're called the vaccaros and i'm out here giving them styling because they have to have shirt pants and you know chaps yeah well they have things called chinks and you can bedazzle the heck out of those and the tack for the horses do you know yeah. what tack is i don't know what tack is what is that surprise me tack. rico nobody knows fashion like you <laughs> that's right well tack is the bridle uh, the saddle the yeah. stirrups i mean there is accessories galore yeah. and i am definitely needed in this area 
So that's where he is. Unbelievable. He just comes off of AEW Wrestle Dream, and now he's already in Arizona taking care of the Cowboys out there. Well, I have to show them how to dress. Well, yeah, of course. You've got to show them how to dress. I mean, without style, there's I got to show you. I'm going to show you. Yeah. Well, you'll see. All right. Oh. Let's get this on the the road. Rob, you ready? Yeah. Yeah. uh, Fashion's not my strong suit. I can't even match two socks together without my Katie's help. So. (laughs) All righty. This is. All right. Look at that. (sighs) He's wired. He's wired. He's he's wired. (laughs) Rico. Oh, yeah. You're looking like you'd be out there on. uh, You need to be out there on the range right there. Cowboy. Look at that. Quesadilla. Wow, take a photo and of the fans right there. I thought there. you guys frisked him when he walked in here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the I'll Cowboy Mounting and Shooting Association. Right. You, know, you have to have um, a revolver like this. Whoa. Single yeah, well. action. <laughs> this, is, uh, this grip has Wild Bill Hickok's last hand. Aces and eights. Aces and eights. So now, but... Like Cooper's four says for firearm safety, you check. Just make sure the gun is empty because in Cooper's four, every gun is always loaded. That's the way you treat it. Mm -hmm. Keep your hand off the trigger and out of the trigger guard unless you're ready to shoot. Be sure of your target and be sure what's behind the target. Mm -hmm. That's Lieutenant Colonel Cooper that made the four rules for gun safety. And they're very, you have to follow them. Mm -hmm. So I have checked. Let the camera check. Look in that little hole right there. One, two, three, four, five, six. Mm-hmm. The gun is safe. Agreed? Yep. Rob? Um, I mean, you know, you could hit me over the head with it. It's still, you know. Well, it's a long range near from it. Phoenix. <laughs> I wouldn't let you on <laughs> an airplane with it. You know? <laughs> no, no. But, you know. Oh, yeah. Swift hand. I do know how to handle guns. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah, Rico. Boom. What about you, Rob? Have you, uh, are you a uh, gun enthusiast? Um, I definitely would not call myself that, but sometimes I do um, wish people had a, a gun. You know, like like, um, and, and you know, it basically comes down to um, either be a be a gun owner or be a victim, right? So, but. Um, uh, man, when I watch I watch videos of like uh, road rage, mm-hmm. oh yeah, and it's like it. You know, you see somebody. Why would you get so angry that somebody accidentally bumped into your car? But they take it so personally. Yeah. They come out of their car, and and sometimes when you know, like when they start like punching the uh, the driver's window or whatever, I always say the same thing because I think about like what if my what if that was my wife? You know yeah. what I mean? Like, dude, like I anger just turns people into monsters, and every yeah. single time I see something like that, or I see somebody being attacked or whatever. I'm always like, man, I wish they had a gun. That person deserves to be shot. That and and that's I always feel like that at the moment. Whenever I see that, that's what comes out of me. And mm-hmm. I and I, you know, I almost think like cars should come with guns. Like if you have a car, you should have a gun. But definitely, I wouldn't put one in everybody's hands because I no. have faith in less than fifty percent of the people as being intelligent. You know. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's, so, it's, it's so strange so, hearing, hearing yeah, you guys man. talk about it because obviously I grew up in the United Kingdom. So guns, yeah, there's you know, no guns. There are no right. guns there. So when I first came to this yeah. country, you know, it, it was it was a different difficult for me to understand at first because, you know, obviously we grew up thinking that's a bad thing. Criminals have guns. That's what we learn in England through the movies. So right. when I came here, also, you got mobsters there in England that would. Have, oh, yeah. You know, because the, the thought is always like, we well, can't just say, OK, everyone get rid of your gun or only the bad guys would have them. Why does that not happen in England? Well, it's because they are, I guess they're, they're tighter on their, their investigation. So even if people get them on the black market, there's not enough to cause, you know, too much of an issue in the UK. Like you don't hear that of shootings in the UK, you hear of stabbings. I was going to say yeah, straight blades. Yeah. You, you street blades and that, but I think in some ways that's, that's even more terrifying to those, you know, that haven't been, because I mean, heck, if you bleed out, 
like you're you're feeling yourself die i mean it's and it's painful at the same time you know there's always a story in the local newspapers of some kids that went out on a friday night to a disco or a bar someone got bottled you know they smashed the bottles on their head and then they get stabbed so it's you know it's um that's their plus job. it makes it more personal yeah you gotta wrong. be you gotta be within an arm's reach to really stab somebody yeah. a gun you don't have to be there right you know I mean, some people, that's why we have murder, you know, because some people can't control themselves. I mean, you're defending yourself. That's something different, mm -hmm. you know, just to walk around and commit a robbery. That's that's the difference between a robber and a burglar. Mm -hmm. A burglar is a chicken. Yeah. He comes in and robs your house, as people call it, when you're not there. Now, a robber is over the limit. He's law because he doesn't mind confronting you. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have home invasion. Those people are violent and homeowners. If you get properly trained in a gun, I'm not saying go out and buy a gun, but get properly trained, take a course, mm -hmm. you know, learn about your gun, fire your gun. Mm -hmm. The last thing you want to be is shot with your own weapon that you gave to the crook. Mm -hmm. yeah. Be proficient in it. Yeah. Know what's workings. I suggest a revolver for first time people because they never jam. You pull the trigger and there's going to be a loud noise. That's it. You know, maybe a, a two and a half inch barrel for home defense. So you can keep it close to you. There's many defensive places, you know, first and foremost, call 911. Mm -hmm. Just so you think somebody's in your house Two, go to the farthest part of the house, lock yourself in and be on the phone with the 911 operator. If they come through that door, you have, you have done everything possible to avoid being violated or attacked. Now they called the ball and you defend yourself. Yeah. yeah. So it's not actually the, the defending yourself that kills the people. It's the lead that comes from the bullet. Yeah. They die of lead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lead poisoning. Yeah. Lead poisoning, Rob. This, this is a this is a great place for us to actually officially start the show. So I'm gonna jump in here. Hey, let me <laughs> can I add something to that? Yeah, thing? yeah. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it, it's not even just a criminal mindset that makes um, a, a gun into a, a dangerous thing. You know, I mentioned like um, road rage, but I think that the your average quo, you know, status quo people, the um, the basic thinkers, the majority, um, they would think if they have that gun near them that that's, that's what's going to solve their problems, you know, and you see people like uh, they get in fights and they're, and they're running, chasing after them while they're shooting at them while they're running away. And they think they're justified because that person hit them first, but no, that's you're, they're running away. You can't do that. Shoot them in yeah. the back, but you got um, it. It's called preclusion. You got to preclude, attempt to preclude yourself or get away from the situation. Okay, great. Now what's preclude mean? That means you, you you try to remove yourself from the dangerous situation. That's why I said, if you think somebody's breaking in your house, you go to the furthest part of the room, lock the door, be on the phone with 911, and you have now removed yourself. You're not worried about your belongings. But if that person comes through that door, you cannot go anywhere else. You are now cornered. Mm -hmm, Life yeah. or death, fight mm -hmm. or flight. Mm -hmm. And then that's when you defend yourself. I love and, it. When, I love and, it when people break into houses and get shot, or even are holding a clerk at gunpoint and get shot. Like I'm, I, I don't. It's just it's karma, you know. That's why. Yeah. I, that's why it's so enjoyable to, to and satisfying. And, and it's not like the movies. Please, if mm -hmm. you're all listening to this, do not run up and check on the guy. Mm -hmm. You don't know if he's dead or not. Then you've just put yourself within arm's reach. He moves. You shoot him again, or her. You stay on the phone with the operator. Is he still breathing? I am not going near him. Tell the police to get in. I'm in the back bedroom. I have my gun on him. He just moved and I shot him again. He made an advance, but do not check on him. Yeah. That's the biggest Hollywood spoof thing. Or, you know, all the see if he's breathing. Tell the 911 operator to keep quiet. Send wow. the cops. Well, oh, I don't know if he's breathing or not. I'm not a medic. Rico, are cops taught to unload when they when they shoot? Because like you know, sometimes no, no, no. You you can escalate to the level of force necessary until you can de-escalate. Uh, a lot of people haven't been in firefights. I've been in a few, and you know, uh, you don't have time to put earplugs in your ear or muffs on when you fire that first shot. Your ears are ringing. 
Mm. You know, you can't you and your mind and the adrenaline that just just flows through your body for fight or flight. Mm -hmm. I'm more of a fight person, mm -hmm. you know, uh, unless I'm running to take cover to shoot you again, you know, but yeah, I just, they're not when taught they to unload, unload anything. They're, they're so, always taught to re reassess the situation. If you think the threat is down, mm -hmm. like say you hit him and you actually, you're not supposed to aim for the leg or wound them. That's a big fallacy and fake rumor. Cops don't shoot to wound. Mm -hmm. They don't shoot to kill. They shoot to actually stop what you're doing either hurting another human being coming at them with a knife, a baseball bat, you know, uh, another gun. Shooting so, them in the leg wouldn't stop them from coming at you. You're not supposed to use deadly force on somebody's leg. Mm -hmm. You will shoot center mass. That's exactly. what you're taught. Center mass. Target, right? Is, yeah. The, the target with the black, uh, the figure on it. But if, but if you shoot them there, Rico, the, I mean, they're where? sure to die in that in that region. It depends. One, it depends on the caliber of bullet caliber of bullet you have, yeah. uh, where the shot placement is. You know, I mean, if you hit him with a twenty-two, it's going to bounce around and around inside him, but he's not going to drop. Mm. Okay. He's going to get up and be able to come after you. Now wow. you hit him with a forty-four Magnum. Mm. You know, those are the two extremes. Yeah. Uh, he ain't, he'll be pushed that back out of the door. There'll be a hole about that big in his front, about that big coming out his back. Oh my God. Are, are you saying that uh, get, uh, a, a shot to the leg would be more lethal than the body? You're not saying that, are you? No, no, no. Okay. If, if you hit the femoral artery, he's got about three minutes to live, Yeah. but you don't aim for the leg. It's because the, you, you, you're in that heat of the moment and officers miss. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and you can't describe that moment. You you have to live it to understand what I'm saying. There's no words that describes when you're put in that position to defend a citizen or defend your own life, yeah. and you have to draw your weapon. There, I can't explain it or begin to touch. We never will. And and Rico, yeah, the one thing I do want to ask while we're on this subject is because of because of our faith, because of your faith. So when you're in a situation like that, and something does happen that is fatal. What would you do in that situation in terms of your faith, your soul, your spirit? Because obviously someone is dead. Yes. Um, I, God knows the heart mm -hmm. and he would know my heart before I even asked him anything. Mm -hmm. but, but this is mandatory. Uh, officers go to counseling and they're, if they shoot somebody, they're immediately put on a mystery in a mis administrative leave. Mm -hmm. Their weapon is given to, uh, uh, evidence person, and because they ask the offer, how many rounds did you fire? Some say I fired three, and they fired eight. Yeah. In that moment, you're not counting rounds; you're looking at the threat. Yeah. So they count down the weapons, you know, because every officer has a full mag with one in the chamber. So if it's a 15 round mag, you got 16 bullets. Okay. Your first mag. Now, if you go through two mags, add 15 more. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's. 31 bullets. Yeah. Then they count down and they could tell you how many shots you fired, but mm -hmm. you're off duty and they provide counseling mm -hmm. to get you through this moment, to get you beyond it. Cause it's, it's not a natural act to take somebody's life. It's no fun. No, no. Yeah. I can imagine. All right. Well, let uh, gentlemen, let's uh, start the show officially and dive into the first topic. But before we do that, you know, viewers, what would look good to Rico and I Rico, so lay the smack down on that subscribe button and hit the like. Thumbs yep. up. Hit the like, the notifications, share with your friends and family. We greatly appreciate your viewership. So Rico, uh, some more Bavarian hot chocolate. Oh, yes. Also, grab your favorite beverage. Join Rico, Rob, and I as we toast to a great conversation here. Two legends in the business. Cheers. Cheers. Joe. Cheers. Um, okay. So, AEW and WWE, what a stark contrast. Both of you gentlemen have been in both organizations now. Rico, you recently were in AEW. Rob, you recently went back to WWE. You were on SmackDown. Um, so, before we got on today, viewers, we talked a little bit about the difference between the two locker rooms and between the then and the now. 
So Rico, Rob, I'm going to give you guys the floor to discuss a little bit of that, the contrast, the difference between WWE then and now and the locker room and how you perceive things to change and how you feel about that. So Rico, take it over to you. Well, I remember the locker room uh, when I first got there, uh, 2000, 2001. Um, you knew Vince was the boss. That's it. When he walked around, he met business. And to me, it felt like an oppression cloud over everything. Just a heaviness. Mm -hmm. Maybe oppression is a little too hard of a word. But this heaviness in the air for me, because I'm very sensitive you know, to people's feelings and stuff. So I did notice there, there was pressure. And Rob knows this, and you know this. When I get under pressure and I need to think, I begin to rock extensively. Right, Rob? <laughs> rock and Rico. Rock and Rico. So uh, that was then. And I just went into AEW's locker room. And I, it's night and day from WWE back in the 2000s to AEW now. I mean, everybody was friendly, food. Uh, you didn't feel that heaviness in the air. People were actually talking to each other, getting along. Uh, they have food. Huh? They have they food. Have food. They got a lot of food. A lot, a lot of good food. Yeah. Chicken breast, you name it. And I got to see a lot of guys who were WWE and everybody in the locker room came up to me at one point and thanked me for my career and how, what I did as characters. Cause some of them know my actual shoot background mm -hmm. and my shoot background is nothing like those two characters. Nice. Nothing. You know, but they uh the locker room was fantastic the the executives like sonjay and stuff like that i met mr khan and stuff like that and come mr khan shocked me he goes i remember you from american gladiators i was a big fan big fan. that's 34 years ago yeah that's awesome. 34 <laughs> so that's my take on the locker room rob what do you see yeah no i mean i agree with Everything you say there, Tony's super cool too, huh? Yeah. Yeah. But you know, like it's uh it's real apparent when I when I was in the AEW um world and comparing it to the WWE world, also as you brought up, there's a time gap there. So now the most recent dressing room I've been in was the SmackDown WWE a couple weeks ago in Seattle. And and now that is a, a lot more like the um, the AEW as far as like the changes, yeah. uh, all the they're happy to be there. They're super respectful. They grew up wow. watching us um, and it's a different time. You can you can express the inner fan inside of you more now than you were allowed to back then. You know, like I was taught when I got in, you're either a fan, you're either a, uh, one of the boys or, or you're a Mark, you know? And the first time I got into the dress room, you know, Sabu uh, broke and, and she broke down, you know, you're, it, you know, you're not, if you're a fan, you don't belong back here. If you're one of the boys, you don't talk to anybody. Don't ask for an autograph before the camera phones, you know? And, right. Um, so my whole career, you know, was was like that. I wasn't able to enjoy, you know, like, wow, when I was a little kid, I used to dream of this. Like, I didn't even I didn't stop and smell the roses. But now oh, right. that's everywhere in the business. I'm not saying there's right. not a difference, but that that that. That, that that vibe that we welcome that's like so so refreshing and yeah. and just like a work atmosphere of people that enjoy their job are happy to be there love yep. each other you know it's it's way yep. different than than it used to be and do you yeah. think it's like definitely when i see aew i see more of that like you said you're allowed to be a wrestling fan and a wrestler i get the vibe are they wrestling fans backstage are those guys real big wrestling fans Rock. Which guys? The guy, AEW guys. The AEW guys. In comparison to before, like you said, you were either a mark or you're, you know. Yeah, no, the whole business has changed. Like, I think all the wrestlers now, um, 
are uh they're fans that made it you know what i mean they're and, and for better and worse because there's never been an easier time to get into the business and back you know way back in the day you had to get broken apart and tested and you know swear um and uh you know to america to get in behind the closed doors and um become one of them you know and it, it was all it was all so different then and 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 then the fans they the ones that thought that they understood how everything is now they're in the business and they made it more like they thought it was. And that's changed it. Mm -hmm. And they think that they're playing to a crowd that's just more them. So they don't worry about protecting some of the magic that is a necessary element, you know, for the whole thing to, to work the way that, that we want it to. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely their fans and they don't mind telling me, you know, some of the guys will come up and say, dude, you know, we're just, we're all just like so stoked that, that you're here right now, you know, and I don't know if a lot of guys will tell you, but man, it means so much. And, you know, um, some of the guys specifically that, that stand out in mind, like, you know, I'm always touched when they say that, but when I was in AEW, uh, you know, one of the guys came up to me, um, uh, on, on a few different shows, dude, I know I already told you this, but man, it, it makes us feel like our whole company is bigger just by you be, being here. You know, we grew up watching you and, and, and that kind of a, a welcome vibe is, is a lot more apparent mm -hmm. than back when me and Rico worked together in WWE and it was so competitive and, you know, you, you could only trust anybody with their own limitations, you know, and how far you trust them. But at the same time, most of those guys swore to, they swore the oath, you know, yep. and so... So the, the, the dressing room and the boys were their real family. And some of the boys just knew each other so much more than the guy's own families and wives knew them, you know? And it was yeah. like, it's not like that anymore either. I don't think I don't, it doesn't feel like it at all. It feels well, when you're on the road four or five days a week, you know, yeah. if it's a pay-per-view month, you're on five. You're in, you know, depending on what brand you're on raw, you start Friday, Saturday, you start for SmackDown. And, you and it was worse before Monday. us too. They would go ninety days in a row. You know the guys that we grew up watching. Yeah, yeah, it's very yeah. big, big difference. Very difficult schedule. I I gotta agree with Rob. Rob, I had the same thing with the guys. I told Amir, everybody came up and thanked me for being there. They said they appreciated my work. You know what I did in the past. You know, I mean, just like they treated you. That's what they did to me, and it felt really good. Yeah. Felt really good to have somebody or preach appreciate your work given it was only seven years, but it must've made a difference because after 19, they're still remembering me. Yeah. And, and that's like the, you always told me. And that's the other incredible thing. It's, it's been 19 years and you, you know, you've, you've, you've been here and there. We talked a little bit about your illness last week. You know, you suffered that for many, many years, but like, yeah, it's been a 19 year break. And now all of a sudden you're back out there. And like I said, you haven't stopped styling. I mean, of course, you've been doing that all the time ever since, you know, bodyguarding, doing all kinds of things. But um, one of the things that popped up there was the, the, you know, you talk about the differences back in when you guys were in WWE. Um, so clicks, we know there were clicks back then. Uh, Rob, were you, who, who were your go-to guys that you would travel and just hang tight with in the early 2000s in WWE? Um, so... You know, whenever Sabu was around, you know, um, you know, I think it was part of, I think he was part of the invasion angle. Maybe I can't, re can't remember if he was part of that or if they waited till later on with ECW to bring him in. But I think it was later. Um, oh, so he wasn't part of the invasion, right? For no. for whatever reason, that's no. what I was thinking. I can't remember him being there, but I don't remember why. But um, so I in two thousand one when I came into WWE. I would share a car with uh, Mike Awesome and uh, Mike mm -hmm. Awesome's friends with Sean Stasiak. And then uh, there'd be the three of us. And then Mike was gone. And then it was me and Sean. Um, after that, it was myself and Booker T. And a lot of times Nick Patrick would be with us. And so um, I, I remember seeing that trio get out in the parking lot. <laughs> you, yeah. Nick Patrick, and yeah. Sean. <laughs> and, and and just um sometimes ray mysterio yeah that, i didn't ride with ray uh myself very much like maybe not at all in wwe but always there could have been a random trip that who knows but um that's i think about it for my for my riding partners uh 
that that mostly I I was by myself uh, when I wasn't with uh, Booker T um, or with, with with Sean. You know, Mike was there for a while, and then I don't know if he left the company, and then Nick maybe the same thing. And let sometimes you're on Raw, and then you get switched to SmackDown, so your ride doesn't work anymore. But but I never really uh, had like a, a big click or. You know, I, I liked a lot of different people that were in different cliques, but I didn't, I always felt like I was around the boys enough, you know, like some of the guys four to a car and then some of them split hotel rooms. And then, you know, like I said, they're closer to each other. And that's why they call them road wives. Right. But um, then they are to their families, but I, I never really uh, felt like that. Even when I had a horrible, evil uh, ex-wife, like I still felt like my priorities were never to put the, the job first, uh, which is, you know, Omerta. So I, I kind of broke the code within myself, but that was because I saw the lives these people had and I knew eventually what was going to happen when they're not on the road anymore. And they think they can just go home to that family that they've been screwing over for the last, you know, two decades. I never wanted that, you know, and Rico, we even talked about that back in the day. I remember a conversation with you. Yeah. I was like, dude, this is just a job. You might not be here next week, bro. You don't right. know. Okay. Look, look around, you know, how many people have you already seen that just disappeared? And, and I was telling him, you know, like what's going on during the show telling you that's just the job and you got to be able to separate it. Do you remember that? Oh yeah. And mm -hmm. when Vin, Vin Vince released me, well, he didn't renew my contract because I asked for a raise, but I went right back to, I went to Japan first. They were calling me since December the year before, you know, the year before. And I said, I'm still under contract with WWE. I have till February. You know, well, we don't honor that contract here. I said, uh, you might not honor it, but my name is on the back, on the back of this contract. Vince has till the first to say no. And I'm going to honor that signature. So after the first, send me a ticket. Well, the first came and went and Vince didn't renew me. He didn't even call me. I was on the flight to all Japan. I did three weeks. Buchanan and I won the all Asian tag titles our first night. So we were on the road. And then after three weeks of that, I went, I'm 44 years old. How much more traveling overseas, be away from my family three weeks out of the month, come home a week, mm -hmm. you know? And I said, you know what? Um, I gave wrestling my best run. That's it. And then after I mailed the belt back to all Japan, I got into police Academy. Yeah. Right yeah. there. Uh, March. I went March. Just a, to uh, just a, uh, a short while before you disappeared, we were having this conversation oh. and you, and you I'm going to get a little personal, but, but you were like, uh, man, she knew, you know, that I might have to, um, you know, have a girl with me in the ring. You know, if you have to kiss, it's part of the show. Like she understood that. And I was like, bro, bro, don't, you know, that's your priority with, you know, when you're with the wrong person, then um, it, it can change all of that looking back in the bigger picture. But at the same time, you know, for me, it was my own priorities and I had to respect myself. So that's why right. I stuck to that. You know, yeah. well, that's definitely a good thing to say to the young ones, though, because they can get consumed by it. We can't yeah. consume by work. And then yes, you have to, to get into it, you have to be, you have to sleep, eat, breathe, rest. And you have to want it more than anybody else in the room. And there's all these yep. you know, other very hungry young dudes that really might want it as bad as you. Do they want it more than you? No, you got to prove it, you know? So yeah, just go from that to be like, it I mean, it's it's just like when when my, when mobsters get sworn into the family and they take the oath and they know they're not going to stop selling drugs, even though they're swearing on their life right. that they're okay with being killed if they get caught selling drugs. Sure, yeah, I I understand. Yeah. And then they really, you know, they're like, next thing you know, they're in a trunk of a car. Yeah. 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 Now, Rico, you brought up that point that you made before, because I'm going to ask Rob a question in a minute about uh, when Vince McMahon didn't even give you a call after you, you know you were released or he didn't renew the contract but yeah in the beginning he was kind to you we discussed that before a couple of weeks mm -hmm. ago he did yeah. the surgery for you when you weren't on tv yet you weren't in, right. on, on the main roster but rob now we know everything that's happened with vince mcmahon obviously i don't want to get you into any legal binding or anything like that um but how was vince to you back in the day in 2002 we, did you have a good relationship with vince I always did. Yeah. He, he just always treated me with uh, respect, you know, so I don't like have any uh, really horrible stories. Um, 
I, it was a little awkward for me um, because he would like go out of his way. And um, I know he was a fan of my work, yeah. but you know, when I think back to 2001, I mean, Rico's got 10 years on me, so I don't know if, if this is true for him or not, but I feel like before I was in my like early forties, that I had the mind of a child. And when I think back to when I was in WWE in 2001, my whole perspective of the world and, and you know, what I understood about my relationship with the universe, it was from a kid that was like just out of high school, you know, with not very much experience, you know, and, and, and that's how it feels right now compared to my perspective now. So I always have to take that into account. But Vince would go out of his way if he's walking by um, and we're going to pass each other, he would stop. And, and, and take that moment to engage with me. And, and even though we didn't have anything to talk about and be like, Hey, Rob, how you doing? And I'd be like, awesome, man. How are you? Good to see you. And then it would, sometimes we'd be, um, <laughs> hot out, huh? you know, it was, it, it was kind of like that, you yeah. know? And so I always appreciated that, you know, the only time that I remember, feeling, you know, like I might have to fight him was when um, I didn't want to go overseas to the Iraqi uh, tours or whatever. And uh, I was burnt out for being on the road and counting the days till our Christmas break because we'd have 10 days off. And that's what was yeah. getting through this being on the road. Oh, my God. You know, like eight more days, whatever it was. And then I was like, oh, we're going to go overseas and see the troops. And nothing I ever heard from any of the boys about those trips appealed to me from the the ride over you know to the moving the the flying warehouse that they ride in to get there to the tents to the dirt none of it ever appealed to me and i was like and they said it was volunteer it's, it's voluntary but they expect you all to go i was like yeah i'm not going and that that eventually led to that eventually went from Johnny, you know, to Vince, to me and Vince talking, and then to Vince still thinking that I was going, and, and I got offended at that point because I was like, "No, you don't understand. I'm not going." And and he and I got that sense that this guy thinks he's got a power over me, like physically, and and I got to do something to let him know that if I'm gonna accept any consequences to my actions. And I consider that, and I still choose to take this action. There's nothing you could do about it. You know? So I did think at one point I have to earn his respect, you know, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have this, I'm going to, and I waited outside his office one time. Um, and they kept me waiting. I, they knew looking back at it, they knew that I was mad and, and kept, and maybe even told some people that I, I know I told Paul, I said, Paul, you know, I'm, what, are, what are you doing? I'm waiting. I'm waiting to talk to Vince. I'm going to ask him to pick a hand. I'm going to smack him. And he was like, don't do that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, I've been, I thought about this, you know, I'm like, you know, he, he thinks, you know, it was that kind of, and then they left me waiting out there like an hour and Paul was telling me not to do it. And eventually I walked off and that, you know, like looking back, it probably wouldn't have been a good, uh, <laughs> a uh, good move. I don't know. I really don't think it would have hurt anything either. You know, yeah. I don't know. But you're letting, you're being a man and you're not letting his alleged uh, power overtake you. You have your, yeah, control. That's the word I'm looking for. I think he would have so respected it, honestly, if it was just a smack. Yeah. yeah. Now, was, was Vince, like you guys have talked about Tony Khan. Was Vince a, a mark for wrestling or was he more business back in 02? Was he just more as that had that part worn off for him sort of thing? Or was he still a mark like a, like a Tony Khan, like a big fan? He's no I, comparison to Tony Khan. No, no comparison. No, no comparison. Uh, he's the president. You know, he's Donald Trump or he's or he's just or he's the president of the United States. Um and and that's the aura, you know. When he walks around, it's 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 intimidating to be in his in his um in, in his, his space. It's mm -hmm. like it's like this is probably the most important man that that I've ever met or or that I know. You know, the in most standards you could use. You know what I mean? And yeah, yeah. And it's like it's intimidating because he just he's got so much power, and he doesn't he doesn't show all of his sides to everybody. You know. No. Yeah, so, yeah. There always we saw a couple of those sides on the Netflix thing. Uh, he has three like, brains. Yeah, <laughs> that's what we found out. <laughs> I, I'm trying to just complete one. 
He's yeah. got three. <laughs> <laughs> He's got three. No wonder he never sleeps. One's always yeah. talking to the other. Right. Yeah. And I, I do want to back up a little bit there. I used the term Mark and I associated it with Tony Khan. And I want to I want to state for the record, I think Tony's a wonderful individual. I would I I'm using that term because of what I mean is he's a wrestling fan. So I just, oh yeah, everybody I definitely got that. Yeah, and and from when I talked to him, he likes American Gladiators too. Yes, <laughs> the original show. Speaking of American Gladiators, in a couple of weeks we have a very special guest coming on. One of the American Gladiators, Ice. One of the others. Coming on. Yes, Ice yeah. is coming oh, on. Oh, that's going to be good, Lori Fetrick. Lori Fetrick. She's going to be joining us, so we're going to get a bit of a reunion. They had a Netflix uh, special. Rob, have you seen it? Muscles and Mayhem. I have, yeah. It was good. You think it, it, it yeah. was awesome to go back and then, you know, go back in time and re- revisit how entertaining that was. I, I was actually in, I was the second season, but I was the first. See, the first was a pilot, but they count that as season one. And then they did the second season and got backing by Four Point, Samuel Goldwyn, Universal Studios. And they put the whole new games, they, dumped everything into it and they what they did learn from the first season to the second is they weren't giving enough camera time to the contenders Mm -hmm. so you can actually pull for a contender that was magic for me i mean i had people and it's a 10 hour day to film one hour show because they film the fall and the spring at the same time and the crowds you know because when they build the big stuff you know like the eliminator osha has to inspect it you know, stuff like that. And it takes a little while. And that last event is the most obstacles you can put on that floor. Mm-hmm. And um, Ice was a new gladiator and uh, Diamond was a new gladiator. And my season, Malibu and Titan were released and that brought Turbo and Thunder. Mm-hmm. So I was there on how they work these gladiators and they only had just those. They didn't have any alternates. Yeah. So I, I did a... I went through the lady and a tiger at the end of one eliminator. I think it was the second show. And I went through the paper and turbo, his name is Galen put his leg straight. So when I came through with a shoulder block, cause they have pads, it dropped down. I didn't know it dropped down and I hyperextended his knee. Wow. Well, they didn't have a replacement. So the future shows you saw him wearing a big knee brace mm-hmm. when he went out there, but he wasn't hundred percent, but he still went out there. And then when I saw Muscles of Mayhem, how horrible they treated the gladiators. Mm-hmm. No royalties and merchandise was flying off the shelf. Mm-hmm. Weren't get, getting proper medical attention. They weren't training them right. They weren't, you know, um, catering to their needs. You know, when you're a top athlete like that and you're doing shows, you're going to get injured. Yeah. You know, sometimes you should zig when you should zag. Right, Rob? We know it all happens in our business all the time. That's the number one thing on your mind. A lot of times is, you know, what, what, I hope I make it through tonight, not hurt. So that's why I always, you know, am known for stretching Yep. Up to a whole hour before my matches. Yep. And uh, that's my insurance, you know, that I'm going to be at least in the best uh, condition to have odds in my favor. Of course, there's no guarantee, but right. Yeah. That, and yeah. Great, great subject to break into because every episode, Rob, we love to talk a little bit about health, specifically men's health, because we are all men. So it'd be difficult for us to talk about women's health because we're not women and we're not doctors. Her Just, body, her choice. Well, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> we are the top tier gentlemen in top the tier. room. Top tier gentlemen, actually. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, dr- I'll drink to that, actually. Uh, uh, me too. Hey. Um, but Rob, stretching, um, because we know pro wrestling <laughs> you know, causes a lot of pain and stuff like that. And yeah, Rico and I have been candid. We've talked about steroid use and stuff like that. And, you know, I've used steroids in the past, you know, Um, they were legal back in the day, as we know, but they can kind of cushion the joints while somebody is, you know, on them. Right. So they don't feel any pain. They don't feel the need to stretch, but you brought up how important stretching is. Have you always stretched Rob? Always. Yeah. Um, you know, I picked up the importance of it in gym class in high school. And then uh, and then after gym, I took I took one of the I guess you call it an elective, but it was like on health and fitness, whatever it was called. And I learned more about it. And I'm in 
11th grade and I, in my mind, like I'm going to be a pro wrestler. So I was reading all the muscle and fitness magazines and, you know, trying to figure out everything I could about working out and trying to put on weight, you know, um, I'm 165 pounds telling people I'm going to be a pro wrestler. And everyone's like, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and Miss um, Andershack, who is the health and fitness teacher, taught, I remember her telling me if I'm going to put on muscle and put on size, I'm going to lose flexibility if I mm -hmm. don't stretch. Yep. She said, like, all those guys like that, they can't move. They can't, they can't, you know, reach back and scratch their back or whatever. And I, I remember specifically her drawing, um, uh, drawing a, a, what inside of a body at a, at a, at a it a join or the muscle tendons, but, but she was in the drawing. It shows how, when the muscles come to come together, there has to be a space in there so that they can move and they're not pushing up on each other. And she was saying, when you get um, hypertrophy and your muscles grow, they're going to tend to, to be, you know, blocking into each other if you don't keep stretching them. And, and that just really stuck in my head. So I always stretched. And when I got into martial arts, it became a lot more important. And then yep. I I've always, um, until recently, it, through most of my career, I would pick up one or two stretches a year. And it, it's just such an inner experience. I've always wanted to share my stretch with people. And over the years, mm -hmm. I filmed it several times, then didn't like it. The biggest moment was at DDP studio. He was actually going to distribute. Yep. And, you know, he's, he's got a hell of a distribution. Um, yeah. With, um, Pardon my language. Yoga <laughs> and all that stuff. You got a heck of a distribution. Yeah, with the uh, DDP yoga. And, and, and so I, I was there at a studio and I was like, man, it's so hard to share everything I'm experiencing. And I tried to uh, walk Stevie Richards through my stretch routine. I think we got like a, a quarter of the way through or, or something. And, and I was, you know, I was thinking like maybe like, you know, CGI to show which muscles. And I, I put the audio on afterwards cause I can't talk while I'm doing it. But then that felt like a disconnect. And I, I just, eventually I thought, and I, and I still have the perspective that it's quite possible. It might just be something for me. It's such a, when I say it's such an inner experience, it's not just, the position that your body's in it's where you throw your weight you know what muscles are going to hold your weight so the other muscles can relax and give themselves to you and even that takes a lot of training because your muscles reaction to stretching is it wants to contract to protect from being injured and and, and so you got to teach your muscle to trust you to relax so that you can just pull it a little bit past where it normally goes when they people force it and then they're making themselves contract yeah. Or they're working against themselves and it's like yeah. i'll be like not i'll be on this foot and in a squat and this leg stretched out but then there's breathing and then there's like also while i'm here if i rotate in my waist you know uh clockwise then, then now and then i lean back this way and now i'm gonna feel it more here and there's there's so much going on that i have to be totally within myself to to actually experience all of it and talking even even just you know if someone walks by and i'm like hey yeah good like it brings me out of my moment and then i gotta get like back into it yeah so, yeah, yeah I, I i concur with rob uh martial arts for me taught me the importance of stretching especially what you and i do in the ring you know we do the martial art kicks and stuff like that and you know as well as i know we shoot one of those kicks people are losing teeth mm -hmm. and i don't know rob if you felt this i felt throwing a working kick is harder than throwing a shoot kick so here's a story and by the way i gotta say you know i kicked uh Biss's teeth out and i feel so bad he's such a sweet guy and you know that comes to mind so let me just you know put this out to the universe you know again so sorry about that i did the back kick out of the corner bam and i didn't even know that's how, like, that's how minute the difference is between, you know, making it right there to touch someone's face and being so far that you kick all of their teeth. And I didn't even have an idea. I went, felt like normal. And I caught right back with that kick, you know? Um, but when I learned that very kick, um, 
I, I hadn't had my first match yet. In fact, the uh, the night that I was talking about when I, the first time I got into a dressing room, when they said you're either a fan or you're bar-, that night. Um, I did a run in after Sabu's match. That was my big part. I hadn't had a match yet. I ran in and he threw me into the corner and I jumped up to the second rope and I came back, bam, and I kicked him. I broke his jaw. And and he taught me when I, I remember before when we were working out, I was like, I got this idea. I'd never seen anyone do it. And I said, you know, I want to do a like a jump. We didn't know what a springboard was back then, but jump off the second rope with my back towards the ring and then do like a back kick. And Sebi goes, oh, okay, uh, give it to me. I go, whoa. But I mean, I mean, I was so green. This was like the first couple months I was training. I, I was like, but, but I mean, is there like a way I can do it like without breaking someone's jaw? Because I mean, I don't know how to, you know, is there, is there something which Sheik never taught us how to not hurt each other, how to land right. None of that was part of the training. But sometimes when Sheik wasn't there and I'd be with Sabu, you know, we were smartened up enough to it enough to 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 know, you know, we had to work together, you know, to get uh, somewhat. But he said, you know, he said, um, try to, this is how he said it too, um, try to, try not to break my jaw. Uh, and if you do break it, then I'm, I won't be mad uh, after it heals. We'll try it again and just try to pull back more. Yeah. I was like, that's it. Wow. Said, yeah. He threw me in the corner. Bam. He was eating through a straw for weeks. Oh, yeah. Like I said, a lot of people, these kicks you and I do are actual shoot moves. These are actual defensive moves or aggressive. You know, and like I said, when I throw a working kick, that's harder to me than throwing the shoot. I, it's much easier to really either do the roundhouse or do the, you know, uh, spinning heel kick. You know, it, it just flows because after umpteen years, you know, you do it. You're doing it to the blocking dummies and everything. So uh, to me, it was always harder to get that where I just touched them, yeah. you know, and you know, that that's my experience with it. But but Rico, you've worked as a stuntman. Rob, yeah. you, know, you know that about Rico? He worked as a stuntman. Do you know that? I don't remember knowing that. I probably I might have known that. I uh, played Batman at Six Flags. I was the Michael okay, Keaton Batman. Familiar. And then I was in the Conan the Barbarian show, Universal Studios. Sweet. Yeah. So do you guys find yourselves watching uh choreographed action scenes in movies and trying to analyze how they did do you find that with all the martial arts and every, like you were saying rob you've got to just just barely touch somebody to not hurt you know, when I, I grew up doing that i don't now because now i don't even even on instagram with no budget at all i don't know if the stuff's real or not that i'm seeing right. oh half of it can't be you know people yeah. are jumping up doing two backflips and landing like on one hand it's like yeah. oh, um did he really do that but yeah um, but yeah i taught <laughs> when i <laughs> when i wanted to be a pro wrestler and i was uh, a teenager i would watch chop Saki theater imitate everything i taught myself to run up a tree and do a backflip i never had any gymnastic training I, I taught myself and yeah it was all imitating uh what what i had seen on tv so yeah when i was a kid i was a bruce lee mark a Bruce Lee mark, just yeah. his one inch punch. Everybody's a Bruce Lee mark, I think. Yeah. Well, it, what better mark to have? To be you know, I was, I was thinking about whether I'd bring this up or not, but since you mentioned the one inch punch, uh, we're talking about kicks, but I, I talked about this on my podcast uh, not too long ago. Um, the the punch to do a working punch is so much harder than than the throwing a real punch. For instance, yeah. you know, to to back up what you know what you're saying, Rico, and, and it's and, and like it. I didn't um, I didn't learn to punch until like 2002 ish, like I, all the way up until then. My yeah, punch I, I remember. Sucked. I remember. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, you know, in a, in a in a real situation on the street. Uh, or or in an actual fight where your your agenda is to end the fight as soon as possible you want the punch to be not only really quick but you also want to hide it you don't want them to see it coming and with right. wrestling uh, it, that looks so bad and so my punches used to feel good to me because i had a good jab and i'd be like bam bam and it looked 
horrible. And I, and when people would tell me, my ego would defend my, you know, but like, why do you got a problem with the way I punch? Like, look how many guys punches suck. Cause I hate you. Yeah, there's so many versions. Like a lot yeah. of people, they got to grab them and hit their hand. I still hate that. And a lot of, or, yeah. or, or, you know, or the, the boom on whatever it is. I'm like, there's so many guys that are on top making money that can't punch. Why does everybody um, talk to me about my, but one time black Jack Lanza said, you know what? He goes, I, he goes, come out here to the lobby. He goes, I'm going to teach you how to punch. He goes, when we leave here, you're going to know how to punch. I was like, okay. And, uh, and went out in the lobby, judge dread was there. He was a guy that trained with me in uh, Sabu cause it was Adrian, Michigan. And anyway, man, blackjack Lanza, Lanza taught me how to punch. Like in just like a few minutes, uh, he changed everything. And, and, and my point to all that is that, uh, if you don't really telegraph it so that everybody can see it coming, then it didn't even happen. You know, you throw, you hide it and throw a quick little, you know, bam, bam, something. Yeah. That you, and it, a it, real sh yeah, the not, shoot stuff yeah, it doesn't translate. No, no, yeah. you got to be over animated with the punches and the kicks and any everything you do has to. When I was taught, like with Danny and Rip Rogers and stuff, oh, Rip told me a story. He he had a black eye. I guess he came to you know came to OVW when I was signed, and I said, "What happened?" He goes, "Man." I got in a fight last night and I hit the guy with a working punch and he hit me. <laughs> he, he hit him and he didn't bump and he hit him with a working punch. And I was like, rip. <laughs> but the other guy was a shoot punch. And that's why he had the shiner. Now, now what about my punches? My punches um, were bad for so long. And then once, once I learned how to now they're like my favorite punches to see, but nobody says anything about it because they don't even notice. And that's fine because before they always had one thing to say, and now they don't have anything to say. And that's when I was like, I understood why everyone was so bothered by the punches because they, they, I had everything that, except for that. And then now that I got that, then nobody, you know, would say shit about it. But, but if you look after 2002 and for the rest of my career, I, you know, I pretty much punch them, you know, I just try and hit him like, you know, on the neck or the side of the jaw, like, yeah. least, you know, not, but bam, I, I, you know, whenever I, even, and people don't notice, but you know, a lot of times you gotta do like a one, two spot, like my, big famous match everybody saw with John Cena go back and that. it's like boom and it's like you know it, I got taught in old school better to fucking really lay it in than to miss or to make it because yeah. it was all about protecting the business business yeah there. now they're like even the idea of this move is going to expose the business but let's just do it anyway yeah that's yeah. what it's become now, what's the difference, though, between screen acting punch? Because like you just said there, in wrestling, especially as we've progressed now, it really looks like they are connecting now. Whereas in the early 90s, I could tell they didn't really. So, but in movies, because. In know, movies, you don't have to make contact because nope. it's camera angles. So it's can't, know, I was just going to say that. Bam, and you don't yeah. even have, don't tell, you shouldn't touch each other. Right? No. Right. No, in, in the acting, uh, stunt, I mean, a live show, a little bit. But you could, unless you're, because this is before I was taught wrestling, you know, I, when I was Batman, 91, I was, I, I did Universals and Batman at the same time. And Wait, did you know the guys from the Indiana Jones stunt show at Universal or was that a different No, time? I didn't, I didn't meet them. Oh, uh, because I went to the show like around that time and 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 talked to the guy that played the big bald guy that fights Harrison Ford outside the helicopter. When oh, it's been, oh yeah, yeah, Holland. yeah. Todd Holland is his name. And, you know, I got oh. to know He's a good guy, and uh, he, I saw him doing other parts. And but anyway, yeah, I was trying to get into that one time when I was there, just because. So you know, when when you're when, when you're up and coming, and you're like us, you go. I tried out for the uh, American Gladiators when the contest came through, you know, for all of us, and I. Um, you know, we were, uh, what are you going to do? You're going to be a bouncer or back then you could be a male dancer. It was, was one option for, for, for up and coming wrestlers, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Um, but it's all the same kind of, uh, genre, you know, bouncer muscle head kind of, kind of security pattern. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Security yeah. stunts, stunts. stunts. That yeah. would be so cool, but it's even cooler being a star and doing your own stunts, but at the same time, it's still all fun, you know. Well, I think yeah. also also because you need the time. 
I mean, you need time off. You can't go and work a job where you're working, you know, these precise days every week. You have to be there at this time. You have to find a job that's going to pay you enough so you can go and train and then you can go and do shows. Otherwise, you're not going to get noticed. So you got to have a little bit of that flexibility. And I think jobs like that would have definitely provided that flexibility and higher earnings. Well, also, today's world is different than even 2000, 2001. I say that which, every day, Rico. Yeah. The technology we have now, the networking that you could do now, we couldn't do back then. Yeah. You know, and it, it, it cuts down, I guess, the physical work, you know, the manual work, but you still have to put the work in via podcast or uh, networking amongst your friends, you know, and then getting people to jump into your circle. Yeah, it's, a, it's still hard work, but you're not out there hoofing it. You're not manually doing it. Also, you feel closer now. It's like I'm going back in my mind to how I, when I was a kid watching you guys, how distant, how far away you guys felt. You were in the pages of a magazine. That was it. Or on TV. That mm -hmm. was yep. as far as it went. There was no social media back then. There was no sending your tapes into this company with ease. You had to mail stuff. I actually, I, Rico, I don't know what I told you, uh, Rob, I entered one of the tough enoughs. I think it was like 2001. I remember okay. I put a tape together. I sent it over to the States. I spent all the money on the FedEx to say, I can't remember. It was a lot of money. I sent it over. I never got anything, but oh, well, but again, Ooh. it was, it was all so distant. And yeah, the that's, that's why growing up in Battle Creek, nobody knew anybody famous. And here I am dreaming of being on the other side of the TV screen. Nobody even dreamed that big. They all thought I was just nuts, you know, but, but now, do you know, there's a platform where people can actually subscribe to their favorite wrestlers and stay yes. in touch with them. Yes, wow. we do. Yes. Tell oh. us about only wrestlers so this has been uh this is a, a project uh katie and i are um two of of a, a group of five actually little it's a little extra info for you but um but we came up uh, with this idea and i've had uh i've had uh, this idea for a long long time about getting fans involved in wrestling more and it had to do with running wrestling shows and booking the talent and then having the fans vote on who wrestles who and stuff like that. And uh, that conversation led to uh, a much bigger idea. And what we have right now is an organically growing uh, association. Uh, so only wrestlers is uh a, it's a, a place where people can you know like rico you're at the autograph table at the convention in indianapolis at wrestlecon right people are like oh my god rico man it's so good to see you again hand them a business card and say boom you can follow me on only wrestlers and it's got the the, the link there and then boom uh you, the wrestlers all have that platform for their own business like this so they can charge their own subscription, whatever it is, they can give whatever content they want. They can say like, Hey, here's the morning word for the day. Or they can say, you know, here I am. And it's rest of kind of whatever they want to do. It's all, it's up to everybody individually. And, um, and then as the fans join to follow the wrestlers, then they become part of an association and the association has voting rights. That's going to lead the only wrestlers association forward. So at first the votes will be like uh, on small stuff because that's where we're starting. So it could just be on the website or it could be on, you know, uh, whatever. How should Rico wear his hair? You know, what, what about changing our graphics? But uh, eventually uh, when we're doing live shows, they're going to be a big part of not only setting that up, but even what towns to bring us to the plans even go past that, but that's getting really far ahead because right now what we're doing, it's like uh, we call it a, a testing uh, period because our, our website is still every day um, getting a, a few corrections on it, you know, and we're still like next week we're, we're hoping to get the community chat room where everyone that's following right now. And we have people following from like, I think it's uh, 24 different countries or something yesterday. Wow. And we've gotten so much, so much since then that I haven't checked overnight. But the last couple of days, uh, some of the wrestling websites have picked up on it and have been talking about it. And man, it's just been—it uh, made it—it it made it blow up. 
So uh, every couple hours yesterday, we were checking to see how many users we had signed up. And uh, every couple hours, it's like, whoa, look at it now. And we, we, had, <laughs> we have like, um, I think close to 80, maybe a little over 80 wrestlers as of yesterday. Um, but we want all the other wrestlers, you know, Rika, once you on there, when anybody who looks at it and thinks this is something that, that could be for them, then boom, do it. I'll explain it. I, my partner will even set up a profile for you and send you the password. Uh, so you can log in, set your price, do whatever you want. If, if, if that's helpful to you for the wrestler, you know, for the followers, just, you know, um, myself and Katie and the only wrestlers account are free and are always going to be free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. It's 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 like you said, you're bringing the world, um, yeah, exposing us to each other more. Uh, there's a lot more closeness closeness now. And that breeds opportunity. You know, like we said right. back in the day. I mean, it's still hard, though. Again, you're going to get only the opportunity that God gives you. That's it. All right. So that's the reality. You know, we know that. But it's it's giving people more contact. It's explo it's expanding pro wrestling. And I think that's what wrestling needed. Wrestling needed to expand. I often find myself now, now uh, my wife and I, we watch podcasts. I watch wrestling podcasts. I, I watch wrestling documentaries. I do watch a little bit of the content today, which is going to be my next question. But nowhere near, not even a quarter as much as back when you guys were on TV. Not even near that. Maybe an eighth, maybe a third. Uh, not even a third, but an eighth, the tenth, sixteenth, maybe. <laughs> but um, do you guys now? Obviously, the landscapes change. Rob, do you watch a lot of the WWE and AEW today in your in your spare time? Um, not a lot. I I'm going to make an effort to watch more of it. You know. Um, Katie and I put a couple of shows on season pass the other day that uh, that we didn't realize weren't even on. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I wouldn't say a lot. A lot of what I see is clips on YouTube as opposed to uh, watching the actual wrestling show. Every once in a while, I might put the show on, but usually I'll watch one or two matches and, and that'll be enough for me. Okay. Rico, do you, well, obviously now with MX, MXM. M collective collective mxm collective the new uh proteges of rico so now you've got to keep up with all the happenings rico you don't have a choice now i have to i've got like i said two of the world most famous runway models in my care yes. so i got to do them right gotta get them styling gotta get them styling and one day maybe just maybe the two of them will be able to stay at the genre sink when they try. yeah yeah well was... uh, they're not ready for a george lasong yet not yet not yet not yet they're not on that level there was yeah there's george lasong that was a great hotel they put me up in yeah in what, a what a beautiful t top of the line one of the best best stays in the entire world i myself yeah. stayed there in, in paris in france ah <laughs> how about you rob how's the old holiday in <laughs> what's the question where do you like to stay like Hotel. when you go out hotels mm, you know i usually just hit uh well usually you know i guess that doesn't affect me i was gonna say usually you know like it's taken care of for me now so but that's not a factor. It still doesn't. I don't know. I mean, you know, the nicer, the better. If yeah. I if, if I'm paying for it, I usually uh, have my standards set, and I usually use like either Expedia or Priceline or something, and right. I find something that's in my budget has enough stars, you know. Um, and when I was on the road and trying not to spend everything every night, you know, I would, I would, you know, it, it, my standard was like maybe like a three star, you know, if it got below that, then the sheets aren't going to fit the bed and stuff. Uh, but, you know, there's some really nice hotels. Sometimes you get in where um, too much, you know, it's like fluffy, like, okay, how much, why it's 200 extra a night for this room because I got 15 pillows surrounding the room. I'm not going to, what, I don't need those, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I had to, uh, Mr. Khan had to put me up. It was such a late notice call. Yeah. And I said, I, I only require the best. Mm -hmm. So he put me up on the, the Zorz the song. Zorz the song. Yeah. It was, yeah. Uh, it seems yeah. the AEW boys don't all stay at the same hotel either from my experience. Or maybe right. he just put me up 
in a different one than most of the guys are at. But yeah, it seems like, you know, like they'll be like kind of like spread out in a few different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I noticed that too. Uh, you know, I saw some people here, some, but they all mix. I mean, the camera people, the announcer, yeah. there's everybody. There's like, there's no like, oh, you must respect that one because he does this. Or you must respect that one because he does this. Right. Yeah. The hierarchy, this, the hierarchy. Yeah. There's yeah. none of that there. Everybody is just, they know it's a job. Yeah. They're, they're comfortable with that. You know, I mean, you we're talking Riggs? about, huh? Did you see Scotty Riggs? Scotty no. Duhati, right? No, no. Uh, Scotty Anton. Um, he drives. He he's doing something. I think uh, he's there, but I think he's helping. You know, pick up the guys from the airport or something like that. But you don't. Yeah, know. I had uh, Monsoor pick me up when I flew in. Okay, one one part of my tag team guys, and oh, then okay. uh, of course I took the limousine from uh, the hotel to the airport. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. I mean, why not? Why not? <laughs> Why not? But, but, but <laughs> Rika, one thing I gotta address right now is look at if you look at Rob Van Dam's background. Look at that. I know. Look how beautiful that is, Rob. What is is that area back there? Because I can see all the lights changing. So what what are those? Just to- uh, those are our our cabinets. Our house, our house has a lot of that around it. We we like it, and um, a lot of it was already in, in it, like that. That kind of set the theme, and the orange, um, the lights kind of. But anyway, orange countertop. We got a lot of black and orange around here, and, and fluorescent lighting under the sinks and shit. Those are just cabinets yeah. back there. It looks. I nice. will say, Rob does have a beautiful house. I've Rob has invited me over a couple of times, and it's a beautiful property. Well, thank up you. Up to my standards. <laughs> Definitely up to my standards. We've done so much. Um, we enjoy working on the house, but yeah, we're always adding to it or or repurposing rooms like a studio or something. And uh so um, it's probably quite a bit different uh than than when I last saw it. Uh, yeah. And, and, got and, these, and, and, and do you want to know? Do you want to tell that story of how all that came to be when you first first were there, Rico and and, and Rob? I'll let Rob tell it. Rob, I have, well, like I said, when I left wrestling, I went and did Japan, but then I went right to police work. I went from March to July in police academy, graduated number one in the state. And then by September, I was a state investigator. And then six months later, I was a part time United States Marshal. They call it a district security officer. So you're a full time officer, but you also work for the feds. I did all high profile trials, uh, high. Uh, uh, protection for snitches, tra- transporting from prison, federal prison to federal prison, you know, and you know, you're strapped with an M4, 45 uh, shotguns. I was usually in the chase vehicle. So there, there's a person of interest in a van, mm-hmm. armored van, and there's a lead vehicle and a chase vehicle. And we don't stop for anybody. Mm-hmm. We're doing about 80, 90 to our destination. And they tell the California Highway Patrol, describe our vehicles and leave them alone. And out of all those transports, uh, we had a CHP chasing us for about seven, eight miles. And we weren't pulling over. Yeah. And they finally got on the radio and said, tell this chippy to back off. <laughs> and all of a sudden, <laughs> lights out. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I, I've got to do a lot with that. But yeah. So I was in Vegas, law enforcement. Rob, you take it from there. Oh, I just, um, I remember asking his advice on what I should do with a stalker kind of situation at the time. And and he told me what to do because I, you know, um, like, do I file a report? Like, this is really, you know, not a good situation. Uh and anyway, uh, he came over and walked around the property and told me uh, what I could do to improve security, you know, and make sure you got this and that and um, gave me some some safety lessons, you know, to and uh, <clears throat> and we have added a lot of security cameras and in, in the wall and all kinds of stuff. We got like a fortress here now and um, Rico knew the where to go, you know, with the 
to the police station of what to say, you know, um, couldn't do a restraining order unless a threat was made. That's something I remember learning. Yep. That, um, for him me, just being around and showing up, showing up is not enough for a TPO temporary protection order. I didn't even know where, unless, unless I was threatened, my life was in danger or threatened. If he th then I was told, you know, cause yeah, because there were some words like, you know, a person thought this house was theirs and weird stuff like that. But um, that wasn't enough, though. No, not for that. But like I said, now people are so lackadaisical. They don't understand. Emails and text messages are never erased. Yeah. They are put somewhere that anybody can dig them up. Yeah. And I've had to do that with a few clients myself. I said, what's the number? You know, and when they go for this tpo restraining order there's actually text messages that back up there has been threats yeah and all all the police department has to do is get a search warrant for that that line on that number mm. and they can pull uh, uh computer data out of everything mm. and then there's the evidence interesting i mean we, we could go down a rabbit hole on this oh I, yeah i think there's a yeah, it's like, okay, so now you've got the emails, now you've got text messages, now you can track everything that everyone has ever said or ever done. Said and done. Well, well that's what they were problem. doing. Who'd they do that uh, to? Uh, the football coach. Uh, I guess he was getting praised and somebody dug up something he said, racial, years mm. and years ago and Canceled ended him. up getting fired. Yeah, because you can't even write things, certain things in your text messages anymore. Uh, well, don't forget. Text messages are just black letters on white background. Right. That's it. There's no emotion to it unless you put an emoji, but mm -hmm. uh, there's no emotion. You can't tell like we're talking. Rob and I are talking. Rob, you, you can tell our body language. It's open. We're not sitting here like this, like we're not being interrogated, but you can tell by the tone of our voices. Yeah. That does not transcribe through email or text messages. Mm -hmm. It's to the person's perception. So whatever that person perceives, what you wrote might not be what you actually meant to say. Yeah. Right. You know, unless there's explicitives and that's pretty much a given. <laughs> but, but speaking about good words, what you'll see pop on your screen right now is the brand new style in the podcast t-shirts. They are available. Yeah, they are available on pre-order. And Rico, what is the quote on the t-shirt? I'll let you say it because it is your your quote. What the mind can conceive, the heart can achieve. Yes. So wear it in style. It'll be available for Christmas. Make sure you check that out. Also coming up in the next couple of weeks, we're going to start doing super chat here. So fans, make sure to uh, lay the smack down on that subscribe button and keep up to date with everything. Um, gentlemen, we have come to the conclusion of this show. However, there will be other opportunities. Rob and I discussed on the phone uh, this week a, a very interesting topic. I'll just leave it at that because I want Rob to deal with this on his podcast. Uh, one of a kind, the Rob Van Dam Show. We'll put a link in the description of this video to Rob's show. It's always a wonderful experience with Rob. But uh, yeah, he's got an interesting show coming up where he's going to be dis uh, discussing a certain industry. A certain media industry. We'll just leave it at that. Very interesting. Non-wrestling related. Totally different. <laughs> Rico, you go ahead. Rob. Any no, I want Rob. Let our guest. Yep. Hey. Where are you, Rob? There you hey, go. Hey, follow me everywhere at the real RVD. Check out onlywrestlers.com and see if if it's for you. It might be something, uh, whether you're, you know, it's an open invite to uh to wrestlers to go and uh, and make an account there. There's a Quick little approval process. Bam, you're in, you're golden, it's yours. And we have so many plans that are um, ahead of us that we're going to implement. That's why I like some of the wrestlers haven't even started doing the content yet. Uh, they can even set theirs for free. And, and, and like I said, Katie and I are always free. And um, you can sign up without even subscribing to somebody just to see, I don't know what you see besides thumbnails, but I'm still learning a lot, but we got even, even, you know, the, the chat, when we get the community chat center, which is the next real big thing I'm looking forward to. 
Um, we will also be doing live chats and, uh, and you have those as a wrestler. There's, there's like so many different ways to make money. Uh, be, be, there's a, there's a tip like in the super chats and there's, there's a referrals wrestler to wrestler 5% of everything that they uh, bring in and for 12 months, if they use your referral code, fan to fan, same thing, tell your friends to join up, you get 5% of what they spend for 12 months. We all, we all have referral codes at the bottom of our accounts. And uh, so we're, you know, we're trying to, um, and, and when the fans sign on for free, um the, i even got the company to compensate the uh the wrestlers during a free time if they're doing stuff so they don't have to you know go out without that so we're lots of incentives we're trying to do to get this thing to, to spread like wildfire and we're happy sounds it is. sounds wonderful rob yeah awesome. i think it's a one of a kind thing i think I you're onto something you, i'll send you a link Rico. please yeah awesome. please Thanks, yeah, I, i'd members. love it and and get not only fan but wrestler but i get to say hi to my old friends, the boys. Yeah. Can stay in That's touch what we need the community other. chat for because like right yeah. now, right now, um, if you don't have a user account and you're a creator, you can't see what the other creators are posting, which, which I kind of just understood yesterday um, for the first time, but with the community center, that's the idea of bringing everybody together. But also, I guess creators can open up a user account to, you know, but it's, th those are all the things we're still like working out right now, you know, right. as far as, like, while you're in your infancy, infancy programmers stage. are in Thailand. So every day yeah. we're like, also the back arrow on the chat page, it needs to be fit. But every day we're like, cool, cool, cool. And <laughs> time we're collecting like i said we got people from over uh over 24 different countries so yeah amazing congratulations yeah congratulations congratulations rob a man who is staying busy busy yeah busy it sounds very and very still looks good look yep. at him yeah wow yeah. at least as good as i ever did well <laughs> what are you now 104 yeah. <laughs> yeah like i said you got 10 years on me yeah well <laughs> Rob, it's been an absolute pleasure hosting you today on this special episode of Styling. We thank you. All right, man. Appreciate it, guys. Uh, you. If you go to robvandam.com, you, sh you should be able to see any of my appearances coming up, doing something the 19th. I don't know when this is going to air. We'll put it out uh, tomorrow, Rob. Okay. Well, then uh, in here in Vegas, I'm doing stand-up on the 19th and then uh, a couple of things next week I can't talk about. And then I'm in Winnipeg on the 26th and 27th at the comic con. So um, there's a couple of things to tell the fans that are watching. Look forward to seeing you all soon. There you go, Rob. I'll stop by and when, it, when, yeah, when I'm on my job, you know, cause I got, I work out of a vehicle, you know, awesome. insurance investigator. So yeah, I'll cool, swing man. by. Thanks for the good and then we'll chat. Thank yeah. you so much for doing this, Rob. It's been great right, seeing you and and catching up. Yeah, awesome. have it's a wonderful. fantastic week, everybody. You Thank too, you Rob. Much. Thank. Uh, take care, everybody. We'll see you next time on Styling.